community little athletics administrator, amateur footy player, the guy that fixes your telephone line when there's a problem. Bradley Robert Edwards, aged 50, has gone from suburban obscurity to nationwide infamy in the blink of an eye. Arrested at the end of 2016 over a series of murders and sex crimes that have lingered unsolved in Perth, Western Australia for more than two decades, Mr Edwards has pleaded not guilty to being the Claremont serial killer. He maintains he didn't kill Sarah Spears, Jane Rimmer or Kira Glennon between January 26, 1996 and March 15, 1997. He will go before a judge-alone trial in July. But even before that begins, pre-trial hearings held in February have featured two days of stunning submissions from the prosecution and defence, allegations that have never surfaced before. Some revelations pose many more questions about this long-running case and the absence of any earlier breakthrough. The prosecution had called Edwards alleged offending an evolution and detailed possible DNA links to earlier crimes, from prowling the streets of Huntingdale in 1988 to attacking a social worker in 1990 and raping a woman in Karakata in 1995. Welcome to the fourth episode of Claremont, the podcast, which will take you through in as much detail as possible those pre-trial submissions on the 19th and 20th of February. The new information, which Judge Stephen Hall emphasised could only be considered allegations at this point rather than evidence, went to what the prosecutor Carmel Barbagallo argued was Bradley Robert Edwards' propensity to commit the crimes of abduction, rape and murder. Tim Clark is the legal affairs editor of the West Australian newspaper. Thanks for your time, Tim. That's all right, Gary. Let's start with the submissions Miss Barber Gallo made about a series of incidents that occurred in the southern Perth suburb of Huntingdale in the late 1980s. She referred to these matters as the Huntingdale Prowler series of offending. Here's just a bit of her characterisation of the accused, Bradley Robert Edwards, at the time. And we've used an actor's voice to read what she told the Supreme Court recently. The accused was an introverted and socially awkward man, not involved in any intimate, meaningful relationships. He had a tendency to collect and maintain a collection of women's underwear and a tendency to wear women's underwear and garments, including kimonos. It is part of the state's case of the accused man's fetish for women's underwear or garments. So, Tim, Bradley Robert Edwards was 19 when the Huntingdale offences occurred. Explain what he's alleged to have been doing in the area at that time. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> his family had lived in Huntingdale for several years, um, were relatively well known around the uh, the area. Um, what the court was told was that, or they allege, that uh, Bradley Robert Edwards was the prowler. Um, he was going out at night um, dressed in women's clothing and stealing women's clothing from houses just a stone's throw from his own or his own families. Um, there were uh, nine separate incidents in, in uh, houses within a kilometre of his own um, and they were all strikingly similar. Um, a male dressed in a kimono or a nighty or layers of women's clothing um, either successfully breaking into houses or attempting to break into a house to steal more underwear or steal more clothes or basically um, get his jollies uh, w in that in that way. Um, and they were all in a very tightly packed area. They were all in a very um, tightly packed um, timeline um, and they were... Um, uh, similar enough and significant enough for the police at that time to um, launch basically a full investigation. Now, there was one, though, where he uh, allegedly grabbed an 18-year-old uh, young woman in her house, a house that he seemed to know well enough. Is that right? Yeah. So what the court was told um, was this was an escalation. Um, he started with just um, looking at the drawers, um, stealing things off washing lines. But then um, on this particular occasion, um, he has gone into a house, allegedly, 
um, closed the doors. Um, a house, as you mentioned, that he knew um, vaguely um, through the brother of the um, alleged victim. Um, closed the doors, pulled the phone out of the wall, um, and then gone into this um, young lady's bedroom um, and launched at her, basically. Um, straddled her, um, uh, subdued her from behind, um, and the, 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 the allegation is this was all sexually motivated. He was um, wanting... To, uh, to sexually attack um, this uh, young girl, this teenager. Um, but um, he was foiled, basically, by, uh, by her fighting back. And, of course, uh, at that time, no one was, in fact, charged with any of those matters that you just talked about. So it was basically an unsolved series of crimes, but it's come back up now. Mm. Now, what's the relevance, then, of those incidents and attacks to the series of crimes He's accused of committing between 1995, when a 17-year-old was raped in Karakata Cemetery, and March 1997, when Kira Glennon was abducted. What's the, what's the supposed connection that I know the prosecution were interested in bringing up? So the prosecutor said that um, in 1988, this was um, prowling activity, so-called prowling activity, um, late at night for a sexually ma- motivated purpose, um, under the cover of darkness, um, and then jump forward um, seven or eight years to Claremont um, and a different area and a different modus operandi, but basically the same sort of activity. On the prowl, late at night, uh, vulnerable women um, uh, being hunted, for want of a better word, for a sexual purpose. So the prosecution wanted to draw that line, um, be it a um, not a absolutely straight one um, between that type of um, uh, thought process um, in 88 and uh, the same sort of thought process in 1995, 96 and 97, um, even though um, it might have been done slightly differently. Now, between uh, the Huntingdale incidents of 1988 and the rape of 1995, there was a crime committed against a woman by Mr Edwards at Hollywood Hospital which is in the neighbouring suburb of Claremont. Here's what Ms Barbagallo told the court about that case. The accused attacked the victim from behind, put a piece of material over her nose and mouth with one hand and dragged her backwards with the other arm. The victim struggled but was unable to scream because of the cloth over her face. She persisted. She kicked the accused as hard as she could and was eventually able to break free from him. The victim fled the room. The accused did not say anything during the attack, although he did apologise when the attack came to an end. The hospital security guard came and detained the accused until police arrived. When police arrived, the accused was found to have cable ties in his pocket. The accused was charged with common assault and his fingerprints were obtained and later entered into the National Automated Fingerprint Identification System. So what happened to Mr Edwards over that matter, Tim? Yeah, so this this was a, a just a bombshell revelation, really, um, in the pre-trial hearing. Um, we'd we'd heard some whispers, but I mean, this sort of flashed it out to a massive degree. So um, he was um, at, the, at the time detained by the security guard after this incident happened at Hollywood, um, and within three weeks, he had been um, dragged off to the Perth Court of Petty Sessions, as it was pleaded guilty um, and was given two years probation. Um, so, I mean, he was caught bang to rights. Um, I mean, literally caught in the act um, and, uh, and, and and pled guilty at the first opportunity. Um, it wouldn't happen these days, but was then basically dealt with on the spot and given, uh, given probation for two years. Okay, now, th- th- this was raised purely in relation to putting an argument of propensity towards these sort of crimes by the accused serial killer. Was there more to the submission, do you think, about the hospital attack and the nature of it? Yeah, well, the it's all about, from the prosecution's point of view, getting the full picture, getting uh, all the pieces laid out on the table before you try to put them together to make the picture on the front of the box. Um, so if you take the 1988 um, Huntingdale Prowler and then the Huntingdale Offences alleged, and 95, 96, there's a big gap in the middle. Mm. But... You put Hollywood in the middle of it, slap bang in the middle of it in 1990, um, and that um, is obviously. Um, I mean, that's that's two of the four corners of the jigsaw, if you'd like. If it, there's, he hasn't just stopped and then started again. Allegedly, he's um, he's done this crime and admitted it 
um, right in the middle of it. Um, and, I mean, you look at the circumstances of the crime. Uh, lone woman, vulnerable position, um, dragged from behind, subdued, um, again, for a sexually motivated purpose, even though he was actually only convicted of uh, a common assault charge. Yeah, we're going to get to that in a minute in terms of what, how that was seen by the, the judge when he was looking at all these submissions. But uh, some, of the, some of the more disturbing uh, detail to come out of these pretrial submissions was about the abduction and rape of a 17-year-old in February of 1995. Now, the prosecution alleged this was Mr Edwards's first serious sexual assault in the lead-up to the Claremont serial killings. The accused was 26 at this time. Can you take us through this incident? I mean, and we'll explain that, you know, some of this stuff's pretty graphic, but can you take us a bit through the, the Karakata Cemetery of sexual assault? Yeah, so this, um, of the eight charges that Mr Edwards is now currently facing, these, these are numbers three, four and five. Mm. On their own, this would be a horrific uh, alleged attack. Well, it's a, a horrific attack yep. um, and it's a, a horrific alleged crime. So um, the victim at the time was 17 years old, had been out to Club Bayview in Claremont and was walking home about 2.30, um, was basically snatched off the street, um, um, abducted, put into a car, had a hood placed over her head um, and then was uh, driven around for quite a while um, before being taken to uh, a very isolated part of what is or- already a quite a, 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 a lonely place in Karakata Cemetery. Um, he's then allegedly um, sexually assaulted this this girl um, in the most degrading and in and dehumanising way you could possibly think of. Um, over um, it wasn't over in minutes. Let's let's put it that way. Um, has then um, picked her up, um, dumped her in the bushes, um, and you can imagine the horror and terror of, of being basically just snatched, um, gagged, um, hooded, and then you know violated in this way. But then he's actually come back and moved the victim again, um, and then left her um, for. For, for good and as far as he knew probably um, for dead although um, uh, in the, in this case um, there wasn't the there wasn't the murder that allegedly followed in the uh, in the no because, in the cases to follow well, the, the suggestion is that he may have been you know and these are all allegations and we know that he's pleaded not guilty to this matter in particular of course as as with all of them but he there's some suggestion that there may have been a disturbance there. Some security guard doing a rounds around Karakata may have, may have disturbed him. So, so whatever was going to happen next, we don't know. But she was left there, I think, bound and gagged and, uh, and having to try and um, escape. Something worth mentioning is, is this piece of information that the prosecutor, Ms Barbara Gello, revealed when referring to the Karakata case. She said that before the victim in the cemetery rape scrambled for help at a nursing home, there was a security guard um, who was working in that area. And uh, she says, quote, he observed a white van which appeared to have telecom markings on it drive past towards Karakata Cemetery. I mean, do you, do you recall that piece of evidence coming out and the thought that you know, if, if, and we'll get on to the Telstra evidence soon, but but some security guard working in the area sees a Telstra vehicle, and of course Bradley Robert Edwards was working for Telstra at the time. Yeah, I mean this this Telstra van um, just seems to throughout the whole narrative of of these alleged series of crimes, this Telstra van appears at every significant point along the way, mm. and. Uh, and there was, and there are some suggestions that the van was even seen previously in the Karakara, you know, and not once or twice. I mean, five or six times in the Karakata Cemetery, either um, sat stationary or um, just sort of slowly driving around the area. Now, um, I don't know how many uh, phone lines the um, the residents of Karakata Cemetery would need, um, but um, you would suggest that um, those sightings might also become um, highly significant in the uh, in the grand scheme scheme of the whole prosecution. Well, it, it, well, it seems it's going to be because um, 
So, so just just to explain to people that are listening to this now, so we have we have a situation here where where we have Telstra and Telecom now. Um, it might help you to know that uh, Australian telecommunications company Telstra was known as Telecom up until the middle of 1995. So at that time of the Karakata attack in February, the company's vehicles uh, would have been marked with Telecom logos before they changed to Telstra. From the mid-1990s, uh, 1995 I should say, mid-1995, most of the fleet carried the new Telstra logo. Now, that does bring us, of course, as you just touched on then, Tim, to, to this very interesting, you'd have to say, revelation that came out in these pre-trial submissions where she referred to the Telstra Living Witness Project. I'll just play a little bit of what she told the Supreme Court, and she refers to counts three to eight, which are the charges Mr Edwards faces around the Karakata attack and the disappearance and murders of Ms Spears, Ms Rimmer and Ms Glennon. Counts three to eight were all committed in 1995 through to 1997, when there was a series of incidents involving a sole male driver driving around the Claremont area, approaching young women who were on foot and seemingly alone, and in some cases offering them a lift. The sole driver was either a man who was driving a Telstra vehicle or identified himself as working for Telstra. Okay, so Tim, are there five or so occasions involving this Telstra vehicle we're hearing about? Yeah, so that, that once again, this 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 all came out of the blue. We hadn't heard anything about it before, the, even the pre-trial hearings. Um, so f- uh, on 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 five occasions, um, December '95, um, January '96, December '96, and uh, December '96 again, and then around about Christmas '96. So all. All in in that just over that year, um, this again this this um, distinctive it would seem Telstra vehicle um, is stopping in 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 streets around um, Claremont and Cottesloe and offering young loan um, at times probably um, a little bit uh, um, drunk and certainly vulnerable women um, lifts. Um, the the driver wasn't. Um, according to the prosecution, wasn't hiding who he worked for. In fact, he told people that he were the, 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 the girls that he that he was offering lifts to that he worked for Telstra, um, that it was his car, um, and in one instance, he even told one of the girls that he was um, deliberately driving around looking for damsels in distress like her. So, I mean, putting this all together, twenty odd years later, I mean, it's 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 could be again very significant and and on its own is 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 intriguing as to why um a, a telstra employee would be um would be uh, doing this and, and thinking the way that they obviously were well in one incident uh, involving a telstra vehicle a woman gave specific information about the lift that she'd accepted from the driver when she was on sterling highway in claremont on saturday night in december of 1995 here's what ms barbagello's submission to the court had to say about this particular incident The male driver told her he was heading to Cottesloe Beach looking for damsels in distress just like her. The male driver told her he did not like to see young girls walking around on their own. He drove her to the requested location in Inaloo. When she got out, the male driver also got out and followed her. He grabbed her at least once and tried to kiss her, prompting her to push him away. The driver's description, very broadly, did not exclude the accused man. So, Tim, do we know when these reports came to police about the Telstra vehicle? Were they at the time of these incidents happening or were they years later? Do we know the answer to that? Not really, Gary, but, I mean, using some common sense and an experience, given the detail, the level of detail uh, that we not already know about these reports, um, you would have to think that they, they were made contemporaneously. I mean, if these women were... As the as the the court documents say, you know they'd been out at, late at night. They were, you know, it was around about Christmas time. They were walking home on their own or with one or two friends. I mean, you can imagine what type of state you're in. Um, you might have trouble remembering all those details a week after that mm. happened, let alone yep. twenty odd years past. So, and um, we're surmising that the the reports were contemporaneous, um, but why and how they've come to light now. Um, that's another question. And it's going to be a very intriguing question as well. Okay, so we've got this Telstra Living Witness Project, which has been drawn up these occasions when there's been a vehicle seen and and evidence, or certainly um, testimony from people who have been picked up by this male driver. 
Then to add to it, the prosecution was told about a knife that was found in the southern suburb of Wellard, which is the same uh, area where Jane Rimmer's body was found on August the 3rd, 1996. The knife was found the very same day, Tim, and it, it was turned out to be an, a Telstra issue knife. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, indeed. So on that day, on that road, um, it has emerged that a knife with a telecom logo on it um, was found. Now, apparently these were standard issue knives that were given to tele telecom operators and telecom workers, um, and they need them, obviously, um, in the work that they do. Um, but that one, being there at that time, um, is going to be hugely significant because we've also been told by the prosecutor that there was no telecom work done in that area um, in the months before or after. Um, there was no new lines put up, no... no um, junction boxes worked on, anything like that. So how that knife came to be there um, is going to be massive, and a, also, a massive question. And also we don't know, again, because of the sort of the way that this pretrial submission evidence has come out, we don't actually know at this stage whether that knife was found by a witness and handed to police at a local police station who then passed it on to the macro task force or whether it was just sitting in a lost property box. We don't really know that yet, do we? How these these new matters that we've never heard about, these Telstra links, we don't know how it came up. No, no. I mean, the, the, all those gaps are, are yet to be filled in, which is um, uh, what Prosecutor Carmel Barbagala is going to have to do to the highest um, satisfaction of the law um, in order to, to convince the judge of all the things that he, she wants to. Yeah, well, let's have a listen to what uh, Ms Barbagello said about this knife and how it might be linked to Ms Rimmer's death. It is alleged the knife may have been used in the commission of Count 7. The knife is a standard knife issued to Telecom or Telstra employees. The accused was issued with one of these knives prior to the Claremont series. Two similar knives were found by police in the toolbox in the accused car after his arrest. There had been no work done by Telecom or Telstra in that Wellard area in the time leading up to the discovery of JR's remains. No new Telstra lines were installed in the area for a number of years. All right, so if, if what the prosecution has brought out during these pre-trial submissions continues into the trial itself, and, and we, at this stage we believe that most of it will, then it really raises questions about the possible Telstra link going back to 1995. And I don't know whether the police explored it at the time, Tim. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it's pretty well known for anyone who's even remotely um, watched or... Um, with this, watch this case over the years that taxi drivers mm, were taxi drivers. A, um, a a major um, focus of the police at the time. But as you're looking back in the archives and watching the old footage, Telstra doesn't ever seem to be as prominent or nowhere near as prominent. Um, and so, I mean, that'll that'll be a major question for the reporters covering the case, for the prosecutor, for the defence. For everyone as to why um, when it seemed that there was material with Telstra logos all over it, be it a car or a knife, um, why, why it wasn't explored uh, more fully or if it was explored more fully at the time, why it didn't bear fruit. Um, and, uh, and, and we've also been told that um, a lot of old telecom slash Telstra um, workers mm. who, who were around at the time, whether they were colleagues of Mr. Edwards's directly or indirectly, um, they will become a big tranche of, of witness evidence. Um, there's going to be um, there's going to be quite a few of those that go, go into the witness box and will have to um, answer questions as to, you know, were, were you, were, you know, were you questioned? Did you have any um, did you have any suspicions yourself? You know, were your bosses telling you anything? Yep. I mean, it'll all it'll all come out in the in the wash, but it'll be be very interesting questions nonetheless. Because I think we're all amateur sleuths, but you do you do tend to think, well, if this information was coming in during the time of the macro investigation and possibly before certainly the disappearance of Jane Rimmer and, and, and certainly before the disappearance of Kira Glennon, then we know that thousands of pieces of information were coming in, but the question's going to be how was it cross-referenced, which could have led to this Telstra connection. And, and so we know it's allegations at this point in time and we know that uh, Bradley Robert Edwards is pleading not guilty, but it certainly is 
a real point of interest to keep an eye on in relation to the trial when it comes up in July. Now, look, um, there, there was also some interesting allegations about the time that Kira Glennon went missing in 1997 and what Mr Edwards suggested was his alibi for that period. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so um, according to what we've heard so far, the night before Kira went missing, Mr Edwards was supposed to spend the night in Dawesville, um, which for those not from Western Australia is in the, in the southern half of the state. Um, but he didn't show up at that um, supposed rendezvous. With friends or something. With friends, yeah. yes. Um, now, so they contacted him the following day and said, you know, Brad, Bogsy, where were you? And um, he told them that he was trying to reconcile with his wife um, at the time on that night. And that's why um, uh, he didn't show up. But prosecutors are going to say that was um, an, a, a, an, a lie, not an alibi. Um, and we would have to assume that given that... Um, both Mr. Edwards' wives are slated to be witnesses and absolutely um, big-ticket witnesses in the trial. Um, that information, um, you would have thought, might well have come from, from Mr. Edwards' first wife, that, uh, I don't know, we weren't trying to reconcile, we'd, all, we'd already split up or something, we don't know. But, but so that, um, that alibi um, is, w- will be obviously... Key um, in that in that one murder, but it also would raise questions of well, um, if he wasn't um, with his wife that night, why was he telling his friends he was? Mm, indeed. Now, uh, also the prosecution got into this this evidence again. That's new, you know new to us in the media certainly, and obviously the police had knowledge of this. But uh, this is in relation to fibres that were found in Miss Glennon's hair when she was located, of course, north of Perth uh, under sort of shrub and uh, a bush in Pippadini Road, uh, about 50 kilometres north of Perth. So there was this evidence referred to about fibres that were in her hair that matched vehicles. Mm, yes. So we're back to Telstra yeah, cars again. Course, yep. So these fibres, um, according to the prosecution, um, can be absolutely matched to the fibres that were on the upholstery in, in, in inside upholstery of a 1996 VS Series One Holden Commodore. Um, it's a distinctive type of fibre, distinctive um, mark of fibre and colour of fibre, apparently, um, that can only be matched um, to that car or maybe one other vehicle at the time. Um, and as we've already said, and it's already been established, Mr. Um, Edwards was had access to and uh, a long time access to a 1996 VS Series 1 Holden Commodore through his work at Telstra. So we're going to hear a fair bit about that because I think also the, the, the cargo well of the, of the vehicle as well, those hairs uh, had fibres from the same sort of vehicles mm-hmm. and they're going to say that uh, the probability of it being from a the vehicle that Mr Edwards had access to at that time is is almost 100%, is that right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and this is going to be a massive part of the sort of the tranche of DNA, um, sort of forensic physical evidence, if you like. Um, there's already a 65,000 page fibre um, report floating around in both 65, sets. 65,000 pages. Yeah, um, in, wow. in the brief and um, experts on, on both the defence and prosecution sides have already been briefed to, um, to, to um, microscopically um, go into that fibre evidence because obviously, I mean, if you can prove that those fibres um, in 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 Kira's hair are uh, the prosecution aren't saying that they're the, they're the mm. exact car, yep. they can't prove that, and they've already admitted that or um, conceded that. But the probabilities then um, vastly decrease if you can if you can prove um, beyond a reasonable doubt that they are only from that car. Then um, you know. The um, the uh, the coincidence um, factor um, ramps up off the scale, I suppose. Some of the more confronting details that uh, Ms. Barbagello went into uh, related to uh, the propensity allegations surrounding Mr. Edwards's sexual obsessions. Let's have a listen to some of what Ms. Barbagello told the court. Several devices found in the accused's house upon his arrest contain a plethora of material, which the state says establishes that the accused had 
or has an obsessive sexual interest in the abduction, imprisonment and forcible rape of women in degrading and violent circumstances and or the performance of sexual acts upon women whilst they are incapable of resisting from which he derives sexual gratification. So Tim, she went into a fair bit of uh, detail in relation to that sort of information about the pornography. Yeah, so there was a big stash of porn basically found when Mr Edwards was arrested just before Christmas 2016. Um, uh, There was um, hard drives, uh, USB sticks, um, all sorts of electronic um, devices um, seized and searched um, and forensically searched at the time. And um, it emerged that there was a a big stash of porn, pictures um, and videos and text um, that um, once the prosecution knew uh, what they contained, um, we were very, very interested in. Uh, One of the um, uh, movies was was a a movie entitled Forced Entry, um, which was made um, sort of mid-2010s, I think, by a company called Extreme Associates. Um, which basically depicted um, young girls getting snatched off the street, um, bundled into cars, taken to various locations, and then um, uh, violently raped. Um, it was um, it was described as one of the most abhorrent pieces of pornography ever uh, yeah. ever uh, produced, and that was by someone in the porn industry. Yep. Um, so you can imagine the level um, that it went to, um, and so. Yes, the uh, the prosecution was very interested in it and uh, and wanted to get it um, as part of their um, as part of their evidence. Well, we'll have a look at whether they were successful uh, in down the track here. But first of all, his second wife talked about Mr. Edwards dressing up in women's clothes. Can you remember that? Yeah, yeah. So um, this is probably going to uh, w- a, something called the Edwards brief mm-hmm. which is um, which we learned just recently is that's going this that's what's going to kick off the trial the first month or so we'll go into all in, into Mr Edwards's background and his history and his peccadillos and all this um, and this will I mean obviously um, uh, titillate and um, be of interest um, legally in, in the same way um, because they're saying um, well, the prosecution is saying that Mr. Edwards has, has had a long fascination with um, with women's clothes, dressing up in them, um, going back to what we talked about, at the, the, hunt, the Huntingdale Prowler stuff, that all <clears throat> feeds into that. Um, <clears throat> but again, when they raided Mrs., Mr. Edwards' house in 2016, which is, you know, almost 30 years later, they found um, girdles, stockings, and women's underwear with holes cut out, um, uh, which um, the the prosecution are going to say were for his own um, for his own delectation um, and was uh, still satiating this um, fetishist f- satiating this sort of fetish that he had um, and that uh, apparently according to the prosecution has been um, has been with him since his teens. Now there was also. Um Stories that they'd found, I know, on his computer that he they say he had written and they were stories at which I know that the uh, prosecution were, were again keen to get in as propensity evidence, looking at the idea that he'd, he'd come up with uh, w- with stories about women that were taken off the street and, and sexually abused and, and raped and so on. Now, that, that was a fairly potent and fairly strong piece of the submission that happened in the pretrial. Yeah. So as... Uh they tried to get the prosecution tried to get this um, this porn in as a as a job lot if you'd like, mm. um, but the the two main um, bits of it that they pointed to were the the forced entry movie that I just made reference to, and this and this story one particular story there were quite a few stories, but this one particular story called the Chloe story, which they said um, bore some chillingly. Um, Chilling sort of similarities to um, the the Karakata attack um, uh, in particular, um, but also then drawing that line um, to Claremont. So this was a story about a, a mature age barmaid um, who was who, who's who's abducted from a car park, taken home, tied to a bed, um, and then you know uh, um, sort of attacked and raped basically. Yep. And they said, what are the chances, the, the basic argument was, what are the chances of a man that we allege has been doing this for this, this many years, um, alleged to do Huntingdale, 
Um, we know he's done Hollywood because he's admitted it. Um, alleged to have done Karakata um, and also alleged to have done Claremont. What are the chances that someone else in our community w- uh, would have these pretty um, horrifying um, interests and um, and be so interested in them that they would keep um, stories um, like of this and nature on their computer and be updating them um, we've been told right up until about um, a week before Mr. Edwards was arrested. So that was that, that they were their two main prongs of the argument as to why the pornography um, should be uh, should be before the judge um, in the in the trial proper. Oh, all right, but now the Justice Hall, uh, who is overseeing this as a judge alone trial, he has considered the prosecution's arguments for for all of these for some of these matters that we looked at, including the submissions about the violent pornography. He's ruled out um, that this could be used as future evidence so far in terms of uh, that that section of the brief around this violent propensity towards pornography and so on. That's been ruled out as evidence. Yeah, yeah. So the, I mean, this this came down very recently. This this judgment um, and uh, Justice Hall basically went through it very methodically. Um, he actually watched the forced entry movie. I don't think he particularly wanted to, but the. Um, the um, the prosecutor sort of said, well, how you can how can he consider it without having watched it? So that w- wouldn't have been a very comfortable weekend for for the judge. Um, but after all that, he ruled that um, basically he didn't think it was probative enough to help him make his decision. And if it was before him, um, it was likely to be more prejudicial. Um, than it would be helpful, um, right. and so he and he yeah, so he's basically ruled it all out. We'll just flesh that out a bit. The following is an edited extract, um, voiced by an actor, of some of Justice Hall's uh, re- reasoning for ruling out the pornography references and how it relates to admissibility around the accused character. Generally speaking, evidence that does no more than show that the accused has a bad character or has done other criminal or disreputable things is not admissible. This is because such evidence will usually not meet the basic test of relevance. At common law, an exception is made where evidence of other conduct of an accused person is so strikingly similar that it is capable of supporting an inference that the accused committed the offence. Such evidence is referred to as similar fact evidence. Section 31A provides that propensity or relationship evidence is admissible if the court considers that the evidence meets the two tests contained in section 31A2. Namely, that it is of significant probative value and that fair-minded people would think that the public interest in adducing all relevant evidence of guilt must have priority over the risk of an unfair trial. If the assumptions made in regard to the prosecution evidence prove to be wrong and a later ruling is made that evidence is inadmissible, any possible prejudice can be obviated by the trial judge expressly putting that evidence aside and not taking it into account in the reasoning process. Tim, the defence lawyers attempt to have the Claremont allegations tried separately to the earlier Huntingdale Prowler matters that we've been talking about. They they put in a, a claim that they should be tried separately, that Claremont and Huntingdale were two completely different uh, crimes, alleged crimes, uh, but they were unsuccessful in doing that. Yeah, so um, their argument there was that um, the Huntingdale series of offences um, should not be seen or were, were not close enough as a, as a series of offences um, to be properly considered alongside um, Karakata and um, the, the murders. Um, they were seven years a- apart. Um, they were um, of, the defence argued, mm. a sufficiently um, uh, different nature um, that to be to to to, com- to consider them all together wasn't proper. Um, you know, sort of Huntingdale was um, there was there was no actual sexual motive involved it was do, done during a break in it wasn't a snatch off the street um it was um it was done um supposedly by a man wearing women's clothing with the other ones there's no report of that and they they tried to basically um point to as many differences between the two um distinct charges as they could 
Um, but once again, in the end, um, the judge ruled that he didn't um, he, he didn't take that argument on board or didn't didn't agree with that argument sufficiently. And during the pretrial hearing, he also pointed out quite properly, I think, um, to have two trials in a case like this um, would be. Um, uh, he referred to it as the efficiency of the court, but you can imagine witnesses having to come twice, um, victims having to come twice, families having to come twice. I mean, the whole thing would would have just been um, it's it's almost overwhelming as mm. it is in terms of just the justice system in this state and and the people involved. Um, to have to do it twice would have been um, would have been, uh, I think, from reading between the lines of Justice Hall's questioning right at the end of the pretrial hearing, um, he thinks that he thought. Um, that would be just um, too much of an impost on everyone. All right. Now, th- th- there was the 1990 Hollywood hospital attack and the conviction against the accused. It will be admissible in this matter. That matter, of course, is something that he pleaded guilty to and was convicted of what happened in 1990. Here's how Justice Hall explained his reasons to allow these matters into evidence. It is true that there are a number of features in the Hollywood hospital incident that are different to both the Huntingdale and the Karakata incidents. Those differences are relevant, but, in my view, they do not detract from the underlying common features, in particular the features of attacking an unknown woman from behind and using a piece of material or cloth in an attempt to prevent resistance are sufficiently similar to give this evidence significant probative value. The evidence is capable of making it more likely to a significant extent that the accused was the offender, who committed the Huntingdale offences and the Karakata offences, bearing in mind those essential similarities. The fair-minded person test is also met. There is a risk that the Hollywood Hospital evidence would prejudice a fair trial because there is always a risk with such evidence that it could be used incorrectly. However, any such risk is minimised by the fact that this is a trial by judge alone. As the trial judge... I would be scrupulous in ensuring that the evidence is not misused and that any role it plays in the reasoning process is properly reflected in the written reasons that must be provided. For these reasons, the Hollywood Hospital Offences evidence is admissible in respect of all counts in the indictment. And another fact that we've learned, Tim, is that Bradley Robert Edwards was ordered into a sex offenders treatment program in relation to the Hollywood hospital attack. That came very, out of the blue. Very intriguing, that one, because he was, as I mentioned earlier, he was only um, convicted of common assault. There mm. was no um, sexual motive, apparently, as certainly on the indictment at that time. Um, but he was ordered um, to go into a sex offenders treatment program. He did that um, for almost a year. Um, after um, his admission in in the court of petty sessions, um, which obviously means um, his um, identity or his you know his known um, status to to the authorities um, that puts another layer of it on there. Um, you don't go just go into a sex offenders treatment program and then walk off into the night um, with with no one. Um, uh, keeping tabs on you, or so you would have thought. Or, or do you? Obviously, there was a psychologist report done in relation to that that common assault matter at Hollywood Hospital. Have we heard much of what's in that psychologist report at this stage in relation to Bradley Robert Edwards and why the need for a sex offenders treatment program? Uh, no, not hmm. a word yet. Um, but we do know the prosecutors have it. Um, they 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 have confirmed that. Um, they have all the material surrounding that. Um, they would have had to have all the material surrounding that um, to make, to mount their propensity evidence uh, argument to get get it in. Um, so that um, that 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 whole um, period of time, uh, even though it's not actually related to any alleged charges, um, is going to be very interesting during the trial. Um, uh, we've heard the trial is going to be done in chronological order, so that we'll probably hear all about that after they've heard the the Huntingdale. Um, uh, uh, offences, but um, this evidence about Hollywood is now also admiss- admissible in the Huntingdale evidence um, or the Huntingdale charge. Mm. Um, so, um, so that'll all be brought forward, um, and then it will be and it will be taken back um, to see if it's relevant um, to Karakata and the murders as well.
All right. Now, j- just to just to finish with the the judge summarises again. He he summarises the Telstra Living Witness Project evidence in this judgment. Does he expand on where the information came from about a Telstra vehicle that was picking up or offering young women lifts around Claremont between ninety five and ninety seven? Does he does he talk about where that's come from? Because some of these incidents, and, and this is not lost on on certainly you you and I, Tim, and I know a lot of other people that are that have been following this case. Some of these incidents predate the ninety six disappearance appearances of Sarah Spears and Jane Rimmer and the 1997 disappearance of Kira Glennon. Does he expand on anything about where this particular evidence or materials come from? No, um, Justice Hall has been very, um, whether uh, he's either been very careful um, not to say um, or he doesn't feel a need to. Um, but to me, that's one of the most intriguing questions that remains about all this new evidence that we've heard about um, and, and, and the the, the macro operation um, in its entirety, um, where it's come from, um, when it was given, um, uh, where it's been hiding mm. all these years, um, and probably most um, prominent and uh, and and crucial, you would thought think is um, did the police have it in ninety five. 96 97 was it was it at the top of their entry and then did they have it for all those years after um when um the question of who killed Kira Sarah and Jane just lingered and lingered Claremont, the podcast, will return during the trial of Bradley Robert Edwards due to begin on July 22nd, 2019. This podcast series was written by me, Gary Adshead, produced by Clarissa Phillips, recorded in the studios of Red Wave Media and made possible by the archived resources of Seven News Perth and The West Australian. Music.